Hello everyone, my name is Han. I'm 10 years old and today I will continue reading Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire by J.K. Rowling, illustrated by Jim K. Chapter 2, The Scar. Harry lay flat on his back, breathing hard as though he had just been running. He had woken from a vivid dream with his hand pressed over his face. The old scar on the forehead, which was shaped like a bolt of lightning, was burning beneath his fingers as though someone had just pressed a white hot wire to his skin. He sat up, one hand still on his scar, the other reaching out in the darkness for his glasses, which were on his bedside table. He put them on, and his bedroom came into clearer focus, lit by a faint, misty orange light that was filtering through the curtains from the street lamp outside the window. Harry ran his finger over the scar again. It, it was still painful. He turned to the lamp beside him, scrambled out of bed, crossed the room, opened his wardrobe, and peered into the mirror of, on the inside of the door. A skinny boy of 14 looked back at him. His bright green eyes puzzled under his untidy black hair. He examined the lightning ball scar of his reflection more closely. It looks normal, but it was still stinging. Harry tried to recall what he had been dreaming about before he had awoken. It had seemed so real. There had been two people he had known and one he did it. He concentrated hard, frowning, trying to remember. The dim picture of the darkened room came to him. There had been a snake on the earth rock, a small man called Peter, called Peter nicknamed Wormtail, and a cold high voice, the voice of Lord Voldemort. Harry felt as though an ice cube had slipped down into his stomach at the very thought. He closed his eyes tight and tried to remember what Voldemort had looked like. It was impossible. All Harry knew was at that moment when Voldemort's chair had swung around, he, Harry, had seen what was sitting in it and had felt a spasm of horror which had awoken him. Or had it been the pain in his scar? And who had the old man been? For there had definitely been an old man. Harry had definitely for there had definitely been an old man. Harry had watched him fall to the ground. It was all becoming confused. Harry put his face into his hands, blocking out his bedroom, trying to hold on the pictures of that dimly lit room. But it was like trying to keep water in his cupped hands. The details were now trickling away as fast as he tried to hold them. Voldemort and Wormtail had been talking about someone they had killed. Although Harry could not remember the name, they had been plotting to kill someone else. Him. Harry took his face out of his hand, opened his eyes and stared around his bedroom as though expecting to see something unusual there. As it happened, there was an extraordinary number of unusual things in his room. A large wooden trunk stood open in at the foot of his bed, revealing a cauldron, broomstick, black rose, and assorted spell books. Runs, rows of parchment littered all parts of his desk. That was not taken up by a large, empty cage, which his snowy owl head was usually perched. On the floor beside his bed, a book lay open. He had been reading he had been reading it before he fell asleep the previous night. The pictures and in this book were all moving. Men in bright orange robes were zooming in and out of sight on broomsticks, throwing a red bowl to each other. Harry walked over to this book, picked it up and watched one of the with a score a spectacular goal by putting a ball the ball through a fifty foot high hoop. Then he snapped the book shut. Even Quidditch, in Harry's opinion, the best part in the world, couldn't distract him at the moment. He placed flying with cannons on the best on his bedside table, crossed to the window and drew back the curtains to survey the street below. Privet Drive looked exactly as like a respectable suburban street would be expected to look in the early hours of Saturday morning. 
All the curtains were closed as far as Ari could see through the darkness. There wasn't a living creature stirring inside, not even a cat. And yet, and yet, Harry went restlessly back to his bed and sat down on it. Running his finger over his scar again. It wasn't the pain that was bothered that bothered him. Harry had no stranger to pain than injured. He had lost all the bones from his right arm once, and they had heavily regrown in the night. The same arm had been pierced with a venomous foot long fang afterwards. Only last year, Harry oh, only last year Harry had fallen fifty feet from an from an airborne airborne broomstick. He was used to bizarre accidents and injuries. There were unavoidable if you attend Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry and had a knack for attracting lots of trouble. No, the thing was bothering Happy Harry was that the last time his car hurt him, it had been because Voldemort had been close by. But Voldemort couldn't be here. The idea of Voldemort being in private drive was impossible, absurd. Harry listened closely to the silence around him. He, was he half expecting to hear the creak of stair or the swish of a cloak? And then he jumped slightly as he heard his cousin Daphne give a dramatic grunting snore from the next room. Harry shook himself mentally. He was being stupid. There was no one in the house with him except Uncle Vernon, Aunt Petunia, and Dudley. And they were all plainly still asleep. Their dreams and troubled and fireless. Asleep was the way Harry liked the Dursley best. It wasn't as though there had been any help to him awake. Uncle Vernon, Aunt Petunia, and Dudley were Harry's only living relatives. They they were Mugglebars, not magic people who hated and despised magic in any form, which means that Harry was about as welcome in the house as Brian Rock. They explained away Harry's long absence at Hogwarts over the last three years by telling everyone that, they, that he went to St. Brutus' secure center for incredibly, incredibly criminal boys. They knew perfectly well that at the underage wizard, Harry wasn't allowed to use magic outside Hogwarts, but they're still apt to play for anything that was wrong in the house. Harry had never been able to confine them or tell anything about his life in the wizarding world. The very idea of going to them when they awoke and telling them about his car hurting him and his worries about Voldemort was laughable. And yet, it was because of Voldemort that he had ended up with the Dursleys in the first place. If it hadn't been for Voldemort, Harry would not have had had an enlightening scar on his forehead. If it hadn't been Voldemort, Harry could still have parents. Harry had been a year old the night that Voldemort, the most never the most powerful dark wizard for a century, a wizard who had been gaining power steadily for 11 years, arrived at his house and killed his father and mother. Voldemort had then turned his wand on Harry, and he had performed the curse that had disposed of many full-grown witches and wizards in his steady rise of power. And incredibly, it had not worked. Instead of killing the small boy, the curse had rebounded upon Voldemort. Harry had survived with nothing but a nightening shape cut in his forehead, and Voldemort had been reduced into something very alive. His hair scarred his back almost is extinguished, half fled. The terror in which the secret community of witches and wizards had lived, had lived for so long had lifted. Voldemort's followers had disbanded, Harry Potter had become famous. It had been enough of a shock for Harry to discover on his 11th birthday that he was a wizard. It had been more disconcerting to find out that everyone in the hidden wizarding world knew his name. Harry had arrived at Hogwarts to find head turned and whispers follow him wherever he went. But he was used to it now. At the end of at the end of this summer, he would be starting his fourth year at Hogwarts, and he was already counting the days until he would be back at the castle again. But there was still a fortnight to go before he went back to school. 
He looked hopelessly around his room again, and his eye paused on the birthday cards his two best friends had sent him at the end of July. What would they say if he had wrote to them and told them about his scar hurting? At once, Hermione's voice filled his head, shrill and panicky. Hang up. Your scar hurt? Harry, that's really serious. Write to Dumbledore, write to Professor Dumbledore. I'll go and check mm, common magical ailments and afflictions. Maybe there's something in there about cursed scars. Yes, that will be Hermione's advice. Go straight to the headmasters of Hogwarts. And in the meantime, consult a book. Harry stared out of the window at the inky blue black sky. He doubts that he doubts very much whether a book could help him now. As far as he knew, he was the only living person to survive a curse like Voldemort. It was highly unlikely, therefore, that he would find any symptoms list in common magical ailments and afflictions. As for informing the headmaster, Harry had no idea where Dumbledore was during the summers. How did he amuse himself a moment picturing Dumbledore with his long silver beard, full length with his robe, pointed hat stretched out on a beach somewhere, rubbing suntan lotion onto his long, crooked nose. Wherever Dumbledore was, though Harry was sure that Hedwig, Hedwig <coughs> would be able to find him. Harry's owl had never yet failed to deliver a letter to anyone, even without an address. But what but what would he write? Dear Professor Dumbledore, sorry to bother you, but my scar hurt this morning. Yours sincerely, Harry Potter. Even inside his head, the words sounded stupid, and so he tried to imagine his other best friend, Ron Weasley reaction. And in a moment, Ron's long nose freckled face swims seemed to swim before Harry, wearing a bemused expression. The scar hurts, but but you know who can't be near you now, can he? I mean, you know, wouldn't you? He'd be trying to do you in again, wouldn't he? I don't know, Harry. Maybe curse cars always change a bit. I'll ask that. Mr. Weasley was a fully qualified wizard who was in the misuse of Marco Artifact's office at the Ministry of Magic, but he didn't have any expertise in the matter of curses, as far as Harry knew. In that case, Harry didn't like the idea of the whole Weasley family knowing that he, Harry, was getting jumpy about a few moments' pain. Mr. Wolf and Mrs. Weasley would fast worse than Hermione, and Fred and George Brunt's 16 years old twin brother might think Harry was losing his nerve. The Weasleys were Harry's favorite family in the world. He was hoping that they might invite him to stay any time now. Ron had mentioned something about the British World Cup, and he was somehow didn't want to be his visit partner with anxious inquiries about his scar. Harry, Harry kneaded his forehead with his knuckles. What he really wanted, and it felt almost shameful to admit it to himself, was someone like someone like a parent, an adult wizard whose advice could he could ask without feeling stupid. Someone who cared about him, who had been experienced of dark magic. And then the solution came to it. It was so simple, so so obvious. It, be, it had so it had taken so long. Serious. Harry leapt up from the bed, hurried across the room, and sat down his desk. He pulled a piece of parchment towards him, loaded his eagle feather quill with ink, wrote Dear Sirius, then paused, wondering how best to phrase his problem, and still marveling at the fact that he hadn't thought of Sirius straight away, but then perhaps it wasn't so surprising after all. He had only found out that Sirius was his godfather two months ago. There was simple reason for Sirius's complete absence from Harry's life. Until then, Sirius had been in Azkaban, the terrifying wizard ghoul, Gowl, guarded by creatures called Dementors, slightest soul-sucking friends, soul-sucking fans who had come searching for Sirius at Hogwarts when he had escaped. Yet Sirius had been innocent. The murders for the witcher had been committed had been committed by Worms, Voldemort's supporter, who whom nearly everybody believed now dead. Harry and Hermione knew otherwise. 
but they had come face to face with Wormtail the previous year. Though only Professor Dumbledore had believed their story. For one glorious hour, Harry had believed that he was leaving the Dursley at last because Sirius had opened a hole once his name had been cleared, but the chance had been snatched away from him. Wormtail had escaped before he could take before he could take him to the Ministry of Magic. And Sirius had free for his life. Harry had helped him escape on the back of a hippogriff called Buckbeak, and since then, he has been on the run. The home Harry might have had if Wormtail had not escaped had been haunting him all summer. It had been doubly hard to return to the Dursleys, knowing that he was mm, had so nearly escaped from there forever. Nevertheless, Sarah had been some help to Harry, even if he couldn't be with him. It was due to Sirius that Harry had all his school things in his bedroom with him. The Dursleys never allowed it be allowed this before. Yet their general wish of keeping Harry as miserable as possible coupled with their furious powers had led them to knock his school trunk in the cupboard under the stairs every summer prior to this. But their attitude had changed since they had found out that Harry had a dangerous murder for his godfather. Harry <coughs> had come had conveniently for, forgotten to tell that Sirius was tell them that Sirius was innocent. Harry received two letters from Sirius since they had been back at Privy Drive. Both had been delivered not by owls as usual by wizards, but large, brightly covered tropical birds. Harry was not approved of these flashy intruders. She had been often been most reluctant to let them drink from her water tray before flying off again. Harry, on the other hand, had liked them. They put in mud upon trees and white sand, and he hoped that wherever Sirius was, Sirius never said in case the letter was intercepted, was he was in drying himself. Somehow, Harry found it hard to imagine Dementor surviving for long in a bright summer. Perhaps that was why Sirius had gone south. Sirius's letter, which were now hidden beneath beneath the high musical loose for bus under Harry's bed, sounded cheerful. And in both of them, he had reminded Harry to call him if ever Harry needed to. What he had needed to now, all right? Harry's lap seemed to go dimmer at the cold bright light that perceives some sunrise slowly crept into the room. Finally, when the sun had risen, when his bedroom wall had turned gold and when sounds of movements could be heard from Uncle Vernon and Petunia's home, Harry cleared his desk and crumpled pieces of parchment and rewrote his finished letter. Dear Sirius, thank you for your last letter. The bird was enormous. It could hardly get through my window. Things are same as usual here. Dudley's diet isn't going too well. My aunt put his mm, smuggling donuts into his room yesterday. They told him they'd have to cut his pocket money if he keep doing it. So he got really angry and he chucked his PlayStation out of the window. That's a sort of computer thing you can play. Play a bit stupid, really. Now he hadn't got a mega multiplication part three to take his mind off things. Okay, mainly because the Dursley are terrified he might turn out and turn them in all into bags. If I added to. A weird thing happened this morning though. My scar hurts again. Last time it happened, it was because Voldemort was was a Hogwarts. I don't mm, reckon that he can be anywhere near me now, can he? Do you know if cursed scars always can sometimes hurt years afterwards? I'll send this with Hedgewick once you get back. She's off hunting at the moment. Harry. Yes, thought Harry. Look, all right. There was no harm putting in the dream. He didn't want it to look as though he was too worried. He folded the parchment up and laid it aside his there, ready for when Henry returned. Then he got up to his feet, stretched, and opened his wardrobe once more. With a glancing at his reflection, he started to get dressed before going down to breakfast. That's the end of chapter two.